I am Jenna Stanton, the Executive Director of the Alberta Craft Council, and I'd just like to welcome everyone to our Monday meetup for our feature exhibition, Craft and Science. And before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that Alberta is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. Those of us joining from Alberta are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6, 7 and 8 territories. And all of us are beneficiaries of these peace and friendship treaties. The Alberta Craft Council is dedicated to ensuring that the spirit of these treaties are honored and respected. And we hope that as individuals, you join us in committing to learning, re um, listening, reflecting, and taking actionable steps towards truth and reconciliation. And by celebrating and supporting the creativity of the indigenous crafts people. And I'd just like to now introduce you to our exhibition coordinator, Jill Allen. Jill? Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us this evening for the presentation of the Craft and Science Exhibition, uh, a virtual presentation with artists in attendance. The Craft and Science Exhibition is currently on show in our Edmonton location feature gallery, and it'll be up until July the 9th. Uh, later in July, it'll travel to our Calgary location and be on view there until November the 5th. Um, presenting this evening, we have the artists of the Craft and Science Exhibition, uh, Jane Kidd, Tapestry, Anna Haywood-Jones, Weaving, Leah Kudel, Glass, Trisha Wozni, Embroidery and Metals, and I'm wearing one of Trisha's pieces tonight. Uh, Tanya Duty, Ceramics, Nancy Oakley, Ceramics, M Amanda McKenzie, Print and Collage, Marie Perron, Fiber and Ceramics, Chris Hars, Metals, Karen Wall, Embroidery, Teresa Johnson, Ceramics, Mackenzie Roth, Glass, and Sarah Ritchie, Ceramics. Uh, there were a couple of artists that couldn't join us this evening. Uh, Cora Woolsey from New Brunswick, who is an archaeologist that worked in conjunction with Nancy Oakley on a project that we have uh, some objects in the exhibition about, uh, was unable to attend, and Charles Lutenbrain was unable to attend. So hopefully we'll be able to catch up with those folks later on and share something more about their work as well. All right, so the first part of the presentation will be um, Pachachka style presentations that were pre recorded by the artists that are participating and then partway through we will um, change to some live presentations and so I hope you'll just bear with us at that transition. It'll take a couple minutes for us to switch gears, but for now, I think we're ready to get started. Um, Take it away. The Alberta Craft Council is the provincial arts service organization that develops, promotes, and advocates for fine craft in Alberta. The council has a dual role to support contemporary and heritage crafts as significant art forms that contribute to Alberta's culture and to develop a craft sector of creative, skilled, viable, and sustainable craftspeople, studios, businesses, and networks. In operation since 1980, the Alberta Craft Council promotes craft in Alberta by operating two gallery and shop locations, one in Edmonton, one in Calgary, by operating the largest public gallery in the province dedicated to exhibiting craft arts, and organizing 15 to 20 exhibitions each year, by running two gallery shops that market work from 150 plus established emerging craft artists, by educating and informing the public and offering craft tours and fun opportunities to be creative together, and by creating publications, marketing ventures and awareness products to members and the public. Membership with the Alberta Craft Council is open to all those working in the craft sector and to anyone interested in supporting the development of Alberta Craft. You can find us online 
at albertacraft.ab.ca. The Craft and Science Exhibition at the Alberta Craft Council Feature Gallery in Edmonton, Canada is an exploration of the intersections between science and craft. The exhibition runs until July 9th and will then travel to the Alberta Craft Gallery C-Space in Calgary, showing there between July 23rd and November 5th, 2022. As we prepared the call for craft and science, we asked ourselves the following questions. How do these two practices influence and support each other? In what ways has or does science impact the way we work as craft artists? How does working with a craft artist improve scientific research? How does scientific research inspire craft artists? What are the similarities and differences between the two fields? What is the role of imagination in science? What is the role of structured method in craft? Both craft and science are efforts to learn, to question and test what we already know through trial and error. Both serve to expand our understanding and appreciation of the environment and materials around us. Through haptic activity, craft artists become experts about their materials and form, relying on traditional methods and knowledge as groundwork for further discovery and expression. Likewise, scientists study traditional methodologies and a canon of historical research in order to push forward to new understanding and revelation. Both scientists and craft makers begin with an imagined goal or a problem to solve and set out to prove and test their ideas. Craft makers look to scientific and technological advances to improve their results with the materials and methods they use and to reduce their footprint on the environment. Through science, we have arrived at a new understanding of the effect of craft processes have on our bodies and environment. As we learn and better understand our materials and processes, do our ideas and imaginations about new possibilities and future works grow? Scientists sometimes invite artists to collaborate in their research in order to have a different perspective and to benefit from the experience that comes from a dedicated studio time, empirical knowledge. How do these working relationships change and improve outcomes for researchers? Does a craft perspective also contribute some poetry to the outcomes of scientific research? In the Craft and Science exhibition, we have examples of craft artists and researchers working together. Craft artists who have been influenced and inspired by science and scientists. Craft artists exploring imaginary science and craft artists whose works are used in scientific applications and for scientific explorations. While we have many and various approaches represented in the exhibition, there are yet many more in existence. Thank you for joining this evening to explore this exhibition together online virtually. Thank you to the Alberta Craft Council for organizing such an interesting exhibition. My work in this exhibition is part of a larger series of six works woven between 2012 and 2016. In this series, I've taken on the role of a pseudo-scientific collector, akin to the 17th century collectors who searched the new world for wonders to house in their cabinets of curiosities. I've created contemporary curiosities, woven hybrids which join two distinct entities, pairings that combine human, animal, plant, or mechanical images. These works reflect an interest in the consequences of using technology to manipulate and engineer the environment. I see these works as scientific artifice, engineered aberration of the natural order. They disturb, but also offer seductive possibilities. Thank you.
Tinctorial Cartographies is an excerpt from my MFA thesis project, which was created in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, known colonially as Nova Scotia. In botanical nomenclature, tinctorial is used to denote plants with dye-bearing properties, while cartographies refers to the art or technique of map making. The project emerged from the desire to create a local lexicon of color. Over a 12-month period, I researched and harvested plants growing across the region. The project grew to involve an intuitive approach, wherein fieldwork would reveal significant plants within an area, and their dye-bearing potential would be discovered upon extraction in the pot. As a white settler and newcomer to Mi'kmaq, the complex cultural and botanical history of the region was largely unknown to me. Over the course of the year, I began to learn and see that the presence and absence of plant species told stories of European colonization and exploitation, extractive economics, as well as human and vegetal resilience. As an artist rather than a botanist, my interest in plants is materially, conceptually, and aesthetically motivated. I'm fascinated by how they occupy space, how they move alongside human migration, and how in their patterns of growth, plants express the social, political, and environmental forces of the past and the present. The project in its entirety includes over 150 hand-woven and dyed textile swatches. Each swatch was woven with linen, cotton, tencel, silk, and wool in both warp and weft. The fibers were mortinted prior to weaving, therefore each swatch was off-white in color until it was placed in a single dye bath and then 225 blocks of color emerge. To explain the swatch composition further, each of the five fibers is represented using three mordanting variables, potassium aluminum sulfate, ferrous sulfate, and no mordant. So in each swatch, there are three groupings of five fibers in both the warp running vertically and the weft running horizontally. Starting vertically from the left, we see the unmordanted section of the swatch. This is followed by the alum mordanted section, and finally the iron mordanted section, which is kind of gray in color. This configuration is mirrored in the weft as well from top to bottom. So the first five fibers are, have no mordant, the next five are mordanted with alum, and the final five fibers are mordanted with iron. The dyed swatches become complex chemical records as each fiber in mordant interacts with a given dye stuff in, in a unique manner, thus creating a color field of reactions and relations. In a way, the resulting swatches merely stand in for their source plans. As the botanical body is transposed into a textile articulation, it commits the plant to material memory. The process gives the botanical body new form, however in doing so only one element of its perceivable self is made present. As the living complexity of the plant's being is lost in translation, it enters into a lexicon of color. The swatches held in tinctorial cartographies offer a mediated encounter with plants within a systematic vocabulary that sits outside of taxonomic classification. It is a method of organization that endeavors to subvert the notion of absolute knowledge and proposes another way of representing, considering, and relating to botanical existence. Hello, my name is Leah Cudell and I am a contemporary artist, a glassblower, designer, and creative adventurer. Over the last 15 years, I've had the opportunity of working in art studios all around the world. One of my most interesting experiences was being on the Netflix show, Blown Away. This picture was taken from the show and then it was put through Photoshop and change slightly. So take a good look at this photo and see if you can notice anything off about it before I move on to the real photo. This is the actual photo before going into Photoshop and used as the Netflix cover photo. I thought this was a great segue into how craft, science, and technology often get completely mixed together and that in itself inspires me in my art practice. One thing I really love is how technology can be used within craft to connect people and to show connection. This piece is called, I really feel like we have a connection and it's made using plasma neon. So when you touch the bubble with your lips, the light goes from your touch to the other person's touch. So what is plasma neon? Plasma neon essentially is a glass sculpture that is bombarded and filled with gas and then it is electrically charged to create different colors inside the sculpture. And then it also reacts to your touch. 
This piece is called Drinking Light, and it is featured in the Alberta Craft Council Craft and Science Show, currently showing. And it basically, when you drink out of the cup, the light goes towards your touch, so you get to experience drinking light. I also really enjoy using electronics and that type of science within my art. These cups right here, they have microphones in them and they have sound sensors, so the lights will sync with the sound in the room, creating these incredibly fun party cups. I also enjoy mixing a lot of different types of mediums and creating things that can be highly personal. Uh, this mug perfectly fits all of my fingers and the rings are all made to slide only onto my hand, creating this incredibly personal experience with a vessel. This project was a group project I created in Denmark with people from around the world, and it's called the Beer Beard. So it's taking beer drinking and vessel making and flipping it upside down into new creative and innovative ways. I also really like to explore the social, the social science of psychology within my art practice. These are glass bubbles that I would take out to a pub and ask people to take photographs with me holding the vessels between their mouths, highlighting that negative space between people. This artwork creates a moment of experience with another stranger, with another person, and it really highlights that absent space between you and really focuses on this moment of interacting with somebody that you've never ever met before. This piece focuses on the psychology of intimacy and what happens when you are completely face to face some, with somebody in an enclosed bubble and what that moment feels like, what that moment of sharing breath with another human feels like. Especially in the last couple of years, the spaces between us have been highlighted more than I ever remember them being highlighted. That's merely made me think a lot about this piece and what it's like to really share breath with people and just all the implications around that lately. This piece is called Let's Not and it's about the idea of not being physically intimate with people. I find that our current culture so much is over sexualized and I wanted to see what would happen if I tried to make a piece that talked about the opposite. If you try to talk about the opposite of something, does it still end up talking about the original topic in the first place? So like, does this piece, even though it's talking about not being physically intimate, does it actually portray this idea of physical intimacy? I like creating art that makes us think about the world and think about things around us and think about how we interact with different spaces and different people. This piece is called Unlanded, and it was created in New Zealand. Unlanded is this idea of continually moving around, never quite feeling like you can settle in one country, city, or place. You kind of perpetually feel like you're, you're floating and never landing and growing roots. A big part of my life has been spent traveling around and moving to different places and different countries and never really quite landing or feeling like I fit into that place and then coming back to my home country and feeling now that my home country is foreign after living in other places. This piece is called The Space Between Myself and I. It's a giant large bubble with an imprint of myself on either side. And the more I look at it, the more I realize that it could be an imprint of anyone and that it's simply just highlighting the spaces between us and our relationships. Thank you for coming to my Pecha Kucha talk. It was great telling you guys a little bit about my art practice. You can find me many places online. Instagram, Facebook, website, email. Um, I would love to hear from you and I'd love to connect. Yeah, so, so come say hi. Thank you. Bye.
The works I made were the result of a great opportunity I had through Mentoring Artists for Women's Art and the Neuroscience Network of Manitoba and the Bueller Gallery, where five artists collaborated with five neuroscientists over a year. This is a lab coat showing neuron activity. I used women's lab coats. The more stained, the better, to show the important work done by the women. Here I've represented the research work of Dr. Sari Hanala, who is the neuroscientist who obtained the coats for me. And I used many of the stains as starting points for the nuclei of the neurons. Additionally, I made her a lapel pin for this coat. And the lapel pin is made from sterling silver that I had carved in wax first and had cast. And I created um, a gem in there with just a little agate stone. I also used vintage collars to show the work of historical women in neuroscience. And here I'm at work on one collar about glial cells. And you can see the picture I'm using to reproduce the embroidery. Here is the completed collar of the glial cells, and this collar represents the work of Dr. Marion Cleves Diamond, who worked was alive sorry, between 1926 and 2017, and did a lot of important research. This is an image of a hippocampus, and my beginning work on the embroidery of it onto this collar. I'm using gold thread and black thread and I'm just transcribing what I see from the image I got off the internet. Completed work of the hippocampus and this work is in dedication to the two neuroscientists who worked on important research about the hippocampus, Dr. Brenda Milner and Dr. Suzanne Corkin. Here I'm beading on felted material for another collar and I'm using gold and black beads with some color variation to give it more texture. And the picture on the right shows the image I used. Here's the finished collar and this collar is dedicated to Dr. Mary Logan Reddick who was the first African-American woman scientist to receive a fellowship at Cambridge College and she was the first female biology instructor at Morehouse College. Here I am at the Bueller Gallery in Winnipeg, Manitoba with the five collars, the complete set of the collars, and at the bottom I have noted my Instagram account. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the work. My work invites the viewer to have an embodied experience. With clay and ceramic objects, I explore strategies of embodiment and connection with the potential for shared experience. Interaction, participation, and the activation of objects through gesture ground my practice. Through attentive gesture making, my performance-based work asks, what more can objects do? Seeking new functions for handmade ceramic objects has extended my practice into new territory, extending into the realm of the poetic. But always in my seeking, paths are traced back to the body. In my work, I continue to explore the potential in making work that relates to gesture and time. I foreground touch in my work because it evidences the moment. Through our sense of touch, we feel present. Touch is direct experience. My recent exhibition, Objects for Empaths, in 2021, explored haptic objects, ceramic objects meant to be touched and interacted with by the viewer. 
In the midst of a pandemic, with touch and interactions restricted, I was contemplating how to show this interactive work. It was then I became aware of ASMR and the genre of video wild, widely available on streaming platforms that delivered ASMR content. Auto or autonomous sensory meridian response. ASMR is an emerging field of study. The response is characterized as a pleasant form of paresthesia and has been compared with auditory tactile synesthesia. Thought to create a sense of calm in the viewer, ASMR seemed like a good format to extend my work to viewers remotely and would encapsulate my intention behind the work. The exhibition was intended as an act of care, an offering to those among us who accumulate stress in the body, who I like to call or think of as uh, empaths. I'm Tanya Duty, and thank you for listening. My name is Cora Woolsey, and I'm an archaeologist, and I study indigenous ceramics from the Maine Maritimes region. And what I mainly do as an archaeologist is look very carefully at the, uh, the ceramic pieces that come out of the ground to try to get as much information out of them as I possibly can. So we look at what we call attributes, so all of the different properties that the uh, ceramics um, can show us. And this tells us about um, how the ceramics were made and what the needs were that people were trying to meet. So this is a painstaking process of getting these ceramics out of the ground very carefully, layer by layer, and, and taking that information and then looking at what the pieces actually look like and what they reveal about how they were made, um, what mistakes were made, so if they were overfired, um, how, how people were forming the pots and decorating them. Uh, and I look very carefully at how decorations and other attributes changed through time. And I also look at the microscopic level to try to understand um, firing temperature and what the ceramics were specifically made out of. And a big part of my work um, is to try to take these ceramics and reconstruct what they would have looked like when they were just recently made. And this, I believe, helps us to understand um, the immense skill that people were using in the past. This is me gathering clay locally um, in Eskasoni. Here I am grinding mussel shell to use as temper. Paddling the pot that I hand built with processed clay. The beginning of the traditional firing, the pots have been warming up for a few hours. Here the pots are fully engulfed in flames. They should be done soon. Enticement is an ongoing body of work that focuses on falsities in perception and the relationship between the natural and artificial. I explore the art form, history, and technical traditions of fishing and fly tying by inventing colorful fusions of creatures and the bait that attracts and captures them. In 2017, I tried out CMYK screen printing and made shark bait for a portfolio exchange. This spurred my current series as I found a rich area that I could explore by incorporating scientific research and working with others in those fields such as fly tires, anglers, ichthyologists, entomologists, and ornithologists. I create my prints by collaging together images of fish along with scans of my late father's collection of tackle, as well as my growing collection of preserved insects and fly tying materials. I do this to create new amalgamations of what could be perceived as an ordinary fishing lure. 
I separate the color layers and screen print numerous altered layers to result in shimmering creations of uncanny decoys. I prefer to adjust the traditional CMYK inks to instead use fluorescent and iridescent inks within my work to evoke the vibrancy of aquatic life. I am drawn to the illusionistic effects of synthetic tackle materials that are often based on the fluorescent and vibrant hues found in the extensive breeding variations within fish. I've incorporated paper marbling and the addition of fluorescent backings on my prints to demonstrate these effects further. This iteration and exhibition of enticement is expanded by printing larger than life creatures that interact on a more immersive scale with the bait that is intended to capture them. My manipulation of color, imagery, material, and paper call for closer inspection to discover the true nature of the image. I am a member of the St. Albert Paper Arts Guild, where I explore utilizing paper making and collage in my work. In a number of my prints, I have areas of paper manipulation, such as where I have hand-spun washi papers and intricately cut paper of these prints to make them come to life and be sculpturesque. In the summer of 2020, I was an artist in resident with the Ayatana Artist Research Program for the Biophilia Program. I, along with a cohort of artists, learned about and discussed art and ecology. I spent time collecting insects, photographing, and using a digital microscope and looking at my environment more closely. Currently, I am in Maine at Appledore Island as the artist in residence at Shoals Marine Laboratory. I am researching and creating my own work while learning amongst undergraduate students in the area of sustainable fisheries, marine mammal biology, field ornithology, and marine parasitology. This body of work, Enticement, allows me to expand my web of questioning into broader areas of ecology and contemplation. I'm very eager to delve further into this research and see where my work takes me after a return from this residency and from exploring the coast. My name is Mireille Perron. I am the founder of the Laboratory of Feminist Pataphysic. Pataphysic was invented by Alfred Jarry at the turn of the previous century. Jarry describes the indiscipline of pataphysic as the science of imaginary solution. Pataphysic remained predominantly a male domain. To remedy this evident lack, I founded feminist pataphysic to promote the reinvention of gendered science through fictive narrative. The spiral is a recurrent model, process, motif in pataphysics. The Laboratory of Feminist Pataphysics embraces the spiral in all its potentialities and deviations. The Laboratory of Feminist Pataphysics is a social experiment that masquerades as work of art and or events. Its latest manifestation is a project titled, in other words, Meaning and Mood. This is an experiment with extruded fiber clay and French knitting, where each method and material translate the other the best way they can. I invent a feminist pataphysical protocol for my material translations that uses unique equivalency and similarities. For example, both clay and wool are extrusion made with customized tools. Or I make fiber clay with local clays from Plainsmont, so I get my wool from a local mill, the Carster Wooden Mill or I walk back and forth in loops in my studio while doing the work and retrace these accumulative pathways in both material. I include material footnotes at the bottom of each modular mural. I also added poster made of rug hookings. Each poster, like a scientific close-up, is a rendition of the effect of spiraling. 
I understand these translations as feminist pataphor. A pataphor uses newly created metaphorical similarities as launchpad to generate other experiments. I look forward to more feminist pataphysical experiments with the Alberta Craft Council. ACC often seems to be to me, to be a branch of the Laboratory of Feminist Pataphysics, or maybe it's the laboratory is a branch of ACC. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to the live portion of the evening. Um, and uh, first up is Chris Harst. Chris, are you there? Are you ready to talk? You can unmute. I am. I am. You are. Excellent. After Chris's talk, uh, I'm going to do some talking for uh, Karen Wall, who couldn't be here tonight. But Chris, I'll let you take it away. Hello, I'm Chris Haas, and I'm a metalsmith, and I make uh, vessels and small sculptures. And I have an ongoing interest in the surface texture. Um, Many of the uh, works I do, sometimes I wrinkle metal, sometimes I weave metal, sometimes I hammer it. And um, there, this is one of a woven piece that's called alibi, and I have no idea why, but it is. It brass and steel. In the past, I've done most of my etching with a, a surface texture with um, photo resists and etched in ferric chloride, which I find to be very, uh, well, not eco-friendly. So I was looking for the craft and science project uh, to find a way to make a more friendly um, etch uh, with less toxicity. I, I came upon, I decided to do electro etching and um, this is the setup that I was using. I used a rectifier for the DC current that you need and um, bisodium sulfate for the electrolyte to conduct the electricity. Um, bisodium sulfate was bought at a hardware store that um, it's used for pH balancing in hot tub water. We tried many samples, many comparisons with different electrolytes, with different resists, with uh, uh, compared them to ones I'd done before and did more um, uh, more experiments with them. Around my my studios in the rural foothills and um, many uh, wild geraniums grow there. And so rather than a photo etch, I decided to use a design for a resist from nature. And so these are the is a picture of the uh, wild geraniums that grow all over the place. This is how I put the, um, the design on the plate. On a prepared plate, I stuck the geranium leaves in a desired pattern, painted over the top of them. Before the paint is dry, I took off the leaves and drew the details of the veins of the leaves in with paint pens. Um, this is a, a picture of a photo etch done uh, etched in ferric chloride which is a very precise etch. It's a, a nesting set of five bowls. But so you don't get such a precise etch if you do use na natural materials. So you get something more impressionistic. This is actually also etched in ferric chloride. It's wild strawberry, strawberry leaves also from around my studio. And um, it's, uh, obviously more impressionistic than uh, the uh, photo etch, but compared to the piece that's in the uh, craft and science uh, project, um, they're very compatible. The um, electro etch wild geraniums compare favorably in effect to the ones that were done with ferric chloride, but um, there's a lot more work to be done with um, uh, exploring different resists and uh, etc. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, Anna, I'm just going to read a, a short statement before we start Karen's slides, and then I'll let you know when it's time to start. All right. 
Um, so this is what Karen Wall says about her, her work that's in the Craft and Science exhibition. In my embroidery works, reflecting anatomy and others stylizing computer circuit boards, I am combining technological, organic, and craft modes of information in order to reimagine, on the one hand, the microbiological in a time of viral panic and pandemic transformation of social, economic, and political relations. And on the other hand, the material foundations of digital culture, electrical circuitry through the messy hand of craft, where a technique traditionally gendered feminine can render codes of masculine science in terms that are accessible, playful, and stripped of their alienating authorities to reveal an aesthetic complexity that both challenges and reinforces the conditions of power from which they emerge. Okay, Anna, let's start. Karen Wall is a multimedia artist who is also involved in academic pursuits. Just as science codes meaning through regulated languages and imagery, Stitching follows certain patterns and processes that allow new meanings to emerge from simple shapes, lines, and motions. Both science and embroidery craft must conform to certain boundaries and constraints of materials and technologies, and yet can generate new combinations and relationships that can enhance ways of seeing. All right. Our next presenter is Teresa Johnson. Teresa, are you there? Are you unmuted? Hi there. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, good. There she is. All right. Are you ready to start, Teresa? Yes, thanks. OK, Anna, could we restart that presentation? All right. Okay. Thanks for thanks for having me um, in the show. It's a wonderful show. Uh, this piece, Fig One, is actually an interpretation of an illustration. So it's actually art inspired by art, as opposed that is inspired by life. So um, what I've basically done is created a three dimensional uh, life size illustration of a frog dissection and kind of frozen in the dissection period. Um, I've always been attracted to natural history museums. They've always been a haunt of mine, um, especially, and I've been especially obsessed with the Victorian um, obsession with natural history collections and how the collections have elevated natural everyday objects through the device of display. So I've actually uh, used the same kind of museum um, vocabulary with the framing device. Um, the interchangeableness of art pieces with these everyday collect collections um, kind of commands the same level of attention uh, to be observed, preserved, studied, admired, to eventually inspire, then reinterpretate, re being reinterpreted by either artist or scientist. I wanted to freeze the art of discovery with that familiar shared experience, the universal vocabulary, the frog dissection, which almost everyone has been through, and whether it mortified you or made you extra curious, everyone has that experience. Uh, the human heart that was displayed there, uh, it also kind of, it, it's, it's just an opportunity to question uh, the, morali the morality of like preserving and putting one life in front of another. So thank you. Thanks, Teresa. All right, the next presenter is Mackenzie Roth. Mackenzie, are you ready? Totally. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. Perfect. New devices. I got to figure them all out. <laughs> all right, all Anna, right. Let's, let's start it. Is it coming up there? I'm not seeing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Mackenzie and today I'm going to be walking you through kind of my creation and inspiration for this ongoing installation work that I'm doing called the Cambrian Revival. So throughout my years of practice, I am a recent graduate of the Alberta University of the Arts and, and starting in my earlier years um, at that university, I started developing a praxis where I aim to make the 
unintelligible tangible by exploring different elements of the void. So from microcosmic horrors to the more vestigial beings of Canada's biological history. Um, taking inspiration from scientific journals and imaginative authors, my work tells the nihilistic narrative of places inaccessible to our senses and beyond what they can feasibly comprehend. This whole body of work started with the piece that's on the screen here, which is an opabenia. It is a Precambrian creature. And once I started working on this, it kind of just the rest of the project fell into place. Um, as a Canadian, I take great pride in my heritage and country. I found it intriguing how fossils such as the Burgess Shale don't hold a greater significance with our identity and history as Canadians. Growing up in a city bordering on the Rocky Mountains, I've always felt a connection to nature and what it conceals. It is within these Rocky Mountains that scientific treasures such as the Burgess Shale are found. And these discoveries are changing and shaping how we view evol evolutionary history, thanks to writings of you know, authors like Stephen Jay Gould. The Cambrian explosion and its discovery has been absolutely fundamental in understanding evolution and the development of life as we know it. However, it's not really a feature often spoken about when highlighting the quote unquote attractions of Canada. So within my practice, I'm aiming to create works that bring light to these fossils through a sort of editorial illustration that aims to educate and fascinate. These works always begin with a spur of inspiration, usually from something I read about or an insta or like an illustration that I see. For instance, the Opabenia, this creature that I've been fascinated with ever since I was little, um, seeing them at the Royal Telrail Museum, and it just kind of went on from there. Um, and then from that point, I began like sketching and mocking up the creature, trying to learn as much as I can about their anatomy. This is accompanied by further research about the fossils. And then with this information, I get to plan how to best create the creature in order to uh, educate and mystify. Um, I really want every piece to become a spectacle of sorts that viewers can then use to learn and become appreciative of. So this piece specifically um, holds a bunch of different creatures from the Burgess Shale that I then in April of uh, 2019 had the opportunity to take it out to Emerald Lake, which is at the base of Mount Burgess, where a lot of these fossils have been found. And I got to go along the hiking paths there and hide all of the fossils along and have different visitors that were walking through get to explore and discover and relive these fossils. I really enjoy using frost glass because of its ghostly kind of ephemeral appearance. Um, I find that it works really well to tell a history of past in this sense of, you know, there was something here. Um, so that was the goal of this exhibition. And since then, since since then, I've continued to add to this series, um, as it is at the Alberta Craft Council right now, I've added a whole bunch of little trilobites, which I'm very happy with. Um, yeah, and then Further to this, I'm planning on taking these to more exhibitions. I'm consistently creating new critters and adding. So feel free to follow me on any of my media on the screen there and you can stay all up to date on all of my fantastical little prehistoric critters. Thanks, Kenzie. That was great. All right, our next presenter, our final presenter is uh, Sarah Ritchie. Um, Sarah, are you ready to unmute and and tell us about your work. I should be good. <laughs> I'm here. Anna's getting everything ready and we'll start shortly. Sounds good. All right. So good evening. My name is Sarah Ritchie. I began working with ceramics around 2018 after finishing my Bachelor's of Science in Archaeology. It was a media I found really grabbed me and I've been lucky enough to work full time as an artist for the last couple of years now. I've always been very interested in critters like bugs, bats, snakes, and so on, and I incorporate all of these into my work. I really enjoy promoting species which aren't regularly seen in a positive light. So not just bees, for example, which we all love, but also beetles and wasps as well. And to feature insects on my work, I make my own molds, which are made up of typically five pieces per species that I then articulate together and then freehand legs and intend on with slip. So this allows me to make replicable appliques that are still unique between every piece that I do. 
And here's an example of the functional wear I make. It's been really compelling to have my work so well received. And it's very encouraging to see the science communication opportunity at Lens. I've seen how approaching insects through art makes folks more enthusiastic to learn about real insects. And to date, I've carved molds for over 35 species. And seeing them all individually in my pots, it really called to mind those fascinating natural history engravings and beautiful bin, pinned entomology drawers in museums. So I started picturing uh, creating a large vessel that I could use to showcase all of these. And here are some of those early mock-ups I did. The vessel itself would have to be very large to accommodate all of the appliques, but I also wanted enough room to be able to align them in how you might see in an Alberta Seba painting with lots of symmetry and a radiating composition to the species themselves. So as I began working on it, it did become apparent in my self-taught career in ceramics that throwing large forms had some tricks that needed learning. So there was a fair amount of trial and error as I attempted two-part forms for the first time, but after a couple of good flops, I did manage. And then uh, after about 12 hours of attaching all 30 species on the vase and letting it dry very, very slowly, here is the finished result. So for the exhibition, I created an accompanying key, again, in the fashion of those specimen collections I was trying to reference and for education purposes as well. And I also made some wall pieces as a form of decorative faux taxidermy to display alongside the vase. Uh, the choice to leave both bodies of work unglazed was meant to highlight the detail of the appliques, but I also found it gave a nice, almost bleached coral feel to the work, which had a really nice presence in the gallery. And for how you can follow my practice, uh, I post my ongoing work on Instagram. I'm often in production mode, but I also enjoy sculpture and tiling and illustration. Um, and I really have immensely appreciated the opportunity to have my work shown in this exhibition alongside so many wonderful artists. So I really wanted to thank Alberta Craft Council. Jenna, do you wanna uh, say anything at this point? I just wanted to thank all of the artists for your time tonight and sharing. There's so much to share. This exhibition is so rich and we do have um, our magazine designer working on a more fulsome online exhibition and didactics that are from the show to go with this. I'm sure everyone could have gone on for probably at least half an hour each and we would have all been enthralled. <laughs> we tried to keep everyone to a tighter timeline tonight just so we could fit so many of the artists in, but it's just been really fantastic to get to spend time with all of your work in the gallery. Um, I've been working down in the office there quite a bit and Tanya with your work and the soundscape that goes with it. I find it really comforting. I'm typically used to being in a ceramic studio. So hearing the tinkling of all your pieces that you have designed have been a real treat over the last couple of months that the show's been on. And we're really looking forward to sharing this exhibition with everyone of our audience and craft family in Southern Alberta too. So looking forward to having it down in Calgary as well. But thank you everyone for your presentations. I really appreciated getting a little more insight into more of your practices. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna.